and also invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. I had an internal debate with myself, which I typically win. about whether, since this was the new moment in a new building, it would be better to uh, kind of preach a kind of standalone new building message. I thought about a, a message about how the church is not a building, and regardless of where the church gathers, whether it be a barn or a field or a beautiful facility like this, the essence and glory of it is in the people who gather and the God they sing to. Um, I trust that would have been a fruitful message, but I chose not to do that. <laughs> because I wanted to make a, a different point, and, and that is that the Word of God and the preaching of that Word one section at a time has great power and worth and value for the people of God. So I actually wanted it to be the case that this meeting would be essentially unchanged from our typical meeting at Caldwell Heights, even including simply continuing in the next section of Philippians so that we could make the point that the preaching of God's word is irrelevant to space, is irrelevant to location. It simply is in itself, infinitely valuable. I wanted to just continue preaching, and it was the case that this particular passage in Philippians was very, very relevant to the appropriate gratefulness we should have to God for providing us a place to meet. So you'll see what I mean as I read it this morning. Let's begin reading. I want to read the, the full paragraph uh, just for context, but we're going to be focusing on verses 18 to 20 this morning. Let's begin reading in 14. Yet it was kind of you, Paul says to the Philippians, to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Now our passage this morning. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply Every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Well, many, many years ago, perhaps 20 years ago now, I remember reading the story of George Mueller. You may know his story, he was a pastor. Uh, in England, and he also started and oversaw uh, orphanages. It's estimated that he cared for as many as 120,000 orphans over the course of his long life. And accounts of his faith in God's provision as he did the work of the Lord are truly overwhelming and motivating, inspiring, convicting. Uh, pick the adjective. They, they, they are overwhelming to pick just one, the following story is recounted in his journal. As he recounts, One morning, all the plates and cups and bowls on the table were empty. There was no food in the larder and no money to buy food. The children were standing, waiting for their morning meal. When Mueller said, Children, you know we must be in time for school. Then lifting up his hands, he prayed, Dear Father, we thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. <laughs> there was a knock at the door. The baker stood there and said, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread 
for breakfast, and the Lord wanted me to send you some. So I got up at 2 a.m. and baked some fresh bread and have brought it. Mr. Mueller thanked the baker, and no sooner had he left than there was a second knock at the door. It was the milkman. He announced that his milk cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage, and he would like to give the children his cans of fresh milk so he could empty his wagon and repair it. Author Randy Alcorn writes, We don't like risky faith. We like to have our safety net below us. But we miss the adventure of seeing God provide when we've really stretched ourselves in giving. We miss the adventure of seeing God provide when we've really stretched ourselves in giving. Paul records this interaction with the Philippians, I believe, to motivate us toward an ambition to see the provision of the Lord. This passage is about giving, but even more so, it's about God's provision. It's about the way God matches our giving with his own abundant provision. The Lord will always answer our sacrifices with his own abundant provision. That would be my summary of this section. The Lord will always match our sacrifices with his own abundant provision. There's two different people that sacrifice in this passage, Paul and the preaching of the gospel, which has caused him to be incarcerated, likely in Rome, and the Philippians in wanting to support the dear apostle with the sending of this financial gift. And in both cases, God is providing for sacrificing servants out of his own abundant provision. There are three points in this passage I want to make this morning. First is the gift, second is the giver, and third is the glory. The gift, the giver, and the glory. Let's look down and see the progress of this sacrifice and provision as it plays out uh, in this interaction between Paul and the Philippian church. Notice in verse 18, Paul is, is finally getting to his description, his experience of this gift that they've sent him. He said, I have received full payment. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Uh, he is trying to communicate the, the abundance uh, that he perceives their gift to be. We can imagine Paul in custody, perhaps under house arrest, carefully budgeting the remaining funds he has left with his co-worker Timothy, perhaps at his side. Suddenly a knock is at the door, and in walks the Philippian Epaphroditus. They greet one another in the name of Christ, and then Epaphroditus smiles and opens his sack to reveal a rich gift from the dear church in Macedonia. Suddenly, suddenly, Paul has everything he needs, perhaps for a week, perhaps for months, perhaps longer. He is well supplied. Paul has sacrificed his freedom for the sake of the gospel of Christ. He is helpless in his incarceration, and yet God has found a way to provide for him through the generosity of the church. And Paul wants them to know of his perspective of their gift. And he says, I have received full payment, and more. I am well supplied. As he considers their generosity, his description of it is abundant. You have been abundant, Philippian church, he says. I, I have received everything I need. And Paul's made it clear repeatedly in this passage, uh, he has no particular interest in personal abundance. This isn't going to increase Paul's personal worth, but it is going to provide for him as he languishes in, languishes in prison hoping uh, that the Lord still has gospel work for him to do uh, when he is released. He is fully supplied. And haven't we seen this be the case every time the church sacrifices in mission? Haven't we seen this be the case in our church? Uh, over six years ago now, coming up on seven years ago, a number of families from around the country, especially in Gilbert, Arizona, uh, prayed and sought the Lord about coming across the country to start this church. But that meant putting their lives and their families and their livelihoods at a certain degree of risk. And yet they felt called to do it. 
They felt called of the Lord to preach the gospel in a different part of the country and to come across the country and to, to, to bring their families and to change jobs potentially and to come to new houses and, and, and look at a, a very different economic situation in certain cases. And so here they, here they come and, and they bring themselves out here. And yet I can testify that for each of them, God has faithfully provided through all of those years. So they put themselves in a place of vulnerability to which I will be personally grateful forever, and, and yet God has faithfully provided over and over again. There has always been sufficient food to feed their families and covering for their heads. God has provided, and we've seen that to be the case over the decades of planting churches and sending out mission work around the world, either locally or globally. God provides he provides through the generosity of his church, not always in this kind of last-minute moment like it was for Mueller, but consistently and faithfully the Lord provides. He provides abundantly. So what, what do we take from this part of this provision? This gift of the Philippians is evidence of the provision of the Lord for those who serve and sacrifice for his mission. We can apply that personally. Where do you see the opportunity to serve and sacrifice for the mission of the Lord? Perhaps it's somewhere here locally. Perhaps it's in evangelism. Perhaps it is even represented in, in this building being a longer drive for some of you. Look, what this passage is saying is the Lord provides for his people when they seek to serve him. The Lord provides for their needs. Perhaps some of you will be called to go on a church plant at one point. And that might seem like an impossible idea, but at some point, we're going to stand up here and talk about some church plant that God has called, some called minister of the gospel to go to some place we think is needed, a new gospel preaching church. And we're going to say to the church, look, church, we would urge you all to pray. We would urge you to pray and consider maybe the unthinkable giving up a delightful house and a delightful community and a delightful church to go and maybe even risking financial loss and, and facing financial uncertainty. And here's what we can say with absolute confidence in our own experience and based on God's word, God provides. God provides and, and we want to stretch ourselves to experience the miracle of God's provision. We want to intentionally look for ways where we can serve him even when that means our safety net is removed so that God can be shown to provide. Uh, that might be financially, that might be physically like Paul where you're putting yourself in a, a vulnerable situation so that God can provide for some good cause, good work, good proclamation of the gospel. We, we want to remove that safety net of personal comfort and ease in order to experience the joy that Paul experienced when this, this man Epaphroditus comes into the room and, and here it is what they've been praying for. Here is God's answer to their prayers. God provides. His abundant generosity always matches our sacrifice. His abundant generosity always matches our sacrifice. Our sacrifice in mission, our sacrifice in serving, our sacrifice in giving. He always provides. Let me say this on the basis of God's word of my own personal experience. There has never been a Christian serving God that God did not provide for. There has never been a Christian serving God that God did not provide them exactly what they needed. And be very careful. This is not the health, wealth, and prosperity nonsense that is preached today. This is not about material abundance. This building is massively in excess of what we need. All right? So this, this is not a definition of what it means for God to provide. God provides what we need. He doesn't always provide luxuries and, and abundance materially. Often, he provides just enough to get through the next day. He provides daily bread, not always monthly bread or yearly bread, but he provides. 
He provides. He provided for the apostle. Paul's testimony is, I am well supplied. I am well supplied. What I want us to consider is, do we experience faith and confidence and hope the way Mueller did before the knock comes to the door? Before the knock comes to the door, in that space where our need is evident and his provision has not yet arrived, do we experience faith in that moment of weakness? Do you experience between the times when you are let go from your job and the new job is coming? Anyone can have faith when the new job arrives. The challenging thing is in that space when there is a need and the provision has not yet arrived. That is the opportunity of faith. And let, let, me, let me change our definition about that moment if I can. That moment is a fairly unusual opportunity to glorify God. See those moments as opportunities rather only as suffering. Think of it this way. Once the provision comes, you won't have to exercise the same faith anymore. The provision will be there. Before the need is realized, you don't have to exercise the same faith because you see the provision. It's when it is removed and you have this timeline of need and uncertainty that you can exercise confident faith in the Lord, you will provide. I am, after all, a Christian who believes in faith and not sight, in believing in a God and whose provision often I cannot yet see. This is a moment to demonstrate the difference between Christian faith and Western morality, being a nice person, a hopeful, cheery disposition. No, when we don't yet see the provision, we trust the Lord that he will provide. The gift reveals the provision of the Lord. And notice also, it reveals it through the sacrifice of the Philippian church. The way God provides often is through the generosity of his people, especially for the mission It's through the generosity of of his people. God does not typically drop money out of heaven. Not often. Usually, uh, it's that God's people are moved to give generously, and in their generosity, God provides. So at the same time, this couple of sentences are both a call to us and a comfort for us. We're called many times to be the means of God's provision like the Philippian church was, while also knowing that God provides, which we'll get more to that in the second point. I have received full payment, Paul says. I am well supplied. How? Well, I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And notice, Paul interprets their gifts to him on his mission uh, to serve the gospel as actually an offering to the Lord. Here's how he defines it. Look down at your Bibles. Verse 18, it is a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. The imagery here uh, is of, of a, a temple sacrifice where the offering is consumed and in various passages of the Bible it says that God smelled the aroma and it was pleasing to him. The sacrifices of his people were pleasing to him. It demonstrated that they trust him and worship him above any other God and they trust him to provide and they believe in him for the forgiveness of their sins and so forth. That pleasing aroma is evidence to God of their trust and worship of him. Well, Paul says the giving of this monetary gift has the same effect, if we can use that language, the same effect towards God. (laughs) To put it oddly, God can smell our giving. And it's delightful to him. He receives it personally. He, He received personally the giving from the Philippians. What a delightful phrase. The the monetary gift they sent was a a fragrant offering. It was a a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. It's it's, it's accepted, which is miraculous in the first place because you have sinners, after all, uh, giving this money. So God accepts the offering, which in in these days, in this culture, uh, they live with a a different set of, of, of understanding than we did. We tend to assume that it is all right for God to accept us. They tended to assume that was a very open question and more likely to be in the negative. Because, after all, 
Zeus and, and various other gods of the pantheon, uh, they, they, they were kind of random and often had tempers and so forth. And so it, it wasn't definite that even your best offering was going to be accepted. It might not be accepted, and you might be thunderbolted the next day because your offering was lame. And, and, and so when he says this offering is acceptable to God, it's acceptable to God, he's saying something profound. He's saying the God of the universe accepts your offering. He receives it. He, he doesn't view it as despicably worthless in comparison to his riches and, and, and wealth and power. He, he accepts it. He takes it. And not only that, he goes beyond that. He says it's pleasing to him. I can imagine people that live in, in the Greek pantheon of gods saying, look, the chief god of all gods, the only true god, he, not only does he accept your offering, he is pleased by it. It pleases him. So, brothers and sisters, let's, let's consider the option we have here. We have the opportunity, like the Philippians, to please the Lord, to please Him, to do something that is a, a pleasure to Him, to bring about the pleasure of God is the, the highest ambition of any created lump of dirt, to bring about the pleasure of the infinite God. And this is what this gift is. It is a pleasure to the Lord. So, again, to reiterate, one of the reasons that we give consistently on a Sunday is because of passages like this. Because God says that our giving is a pleasure to Him. Our giving to the mission of the gospel both locally, globally, it, it's a pleasure to Him. It's an aroma that rises to heaven. We, we might think of the, the incense smoke of that sacrifice rising literally from this room into heaven, and God is pleased by it. The smile of God looks out on the giving of His church. What a delightful thought. Don't you experience that joy when you see your child, perhaps in an unusual moment, be generous in some way? Have you ever experienced that? I have experienced at times one of my children who at times wants to be generous because he's aware of how he's received something. So his response is a good part of his character is that he wants to give. Let me buy that. Let me do that. And when he does that, it's pleasing to me, not because I, I want his money, but because that disposition is, is good. That desire to be generous is good, and that's God's response. He calls himself later on the, the father. And so the father looks down at his adopted children, and he is pleased by their generosity, especially when through their generosity, his own provision can be revealed, The gift is God's provision for Paul. It is a pleasing offering to the Lord. And it is that Lord that Paul wants to assure the Philippians about as he continues. Point number two, the giver. The giver. My God, Paul says. That word my is very important. Paul is, is staking his own personal affectionate relationship on God in what he's about to say, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So we have a promise and then we have the standard and context of that promise. We have the promise and that is Philippian church, sacrificial church, giving church, let me promise you something. My God will supply every need of yours. Every need. He will supply every need of yours. What, what a promise. They've just sent him this sacrificial gift. We, we know that the Macedonia churches, Philippi likely, was not wealthy, so it probably represented a profound sacrifice to abundantly provide for the apostle. And in their sacrificial giving, out of their lack and out of their need... Paul wants to communicate this promise. My God will supply every need of yours. So Lydia, 
in Philippi? Did, did, did you give up perhaps a, a month's worth of purple dye sales in order to supply Paul? And you're not quite sure how you're going to provide for your, your workers or your household in the same way uh, over the next year because of your giving? Look, my God will provide every need of yours. Uh, Philippian jailer, are, are, are you concerned that you, you gave up the savings that you'd had against that hole in your roof in order to provide for the apostle for his food? Listen, my God will provide every need of yours. We, we don't know what needs they had, but really, they weren't all that different from the needs we have to feed and clothe our children, to have a job, to provide for ourselves in some way. Those are the same needs we have. They didn't have flat screens, but they had donkeys. I mean, the, the, the needs just change the picture, right? But it's the same kind of need that you have. And God says, my God, Paul says, will supply every need of yours, every need. And he says that in his word. He says that to us. He says that to you. He says it will be according to his own riches. According to his own riches. Look at that phrase. According to his riches in glory. The, the standard of his provision will be his own riches in glory. God is not miserly. God is not stingy in providing for needs. He is eager to be abundant. This does not mean that you will be wealthy if you give. It does mean that you will be able to perceive the abundance of God's generosity for you. You will perceive the abundance of God's provision physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually as you give God provides abundantly for his people. According to his own riches, he will supply every need of yours. According to his own riches, not according to your morality, not according to your righteousness, not according to your godliness, not according to your comparative superiority to your neighbor, not according to your church attendance, not according to your community group attendance, not according to the... the Blessing of your family to the community according to his own riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And that last phrase is how the gospel comes into this passage. God does all of this in the context of their union with Christ. Because Christ Jesus has ransomed enemies and brought them into relationship with God, he has made orphaned sons and daughters. Now God counts himself as their father, and he is eager to use his own riches to provide for their needs. Now, because of Christ's sacrifice, their sins are no longer a barrier between them and God. God no longer counts them as objects of wrath, but as objects of generosity. God no longer counts them as objects of rejection, but as objects of welcome. Because of Christ, they now have the option of knowing that God the Father will provide all their needs. What a promise for every Christian. In Christ, God will provide all your needs. Do you believe that? You must, but do you? Do you believe that? Do you believe God will provide all your needs? Hear what I'm saying? I don't want to underestimate this importance. You don't need a Lexus. You don't need to be more beautiful. You don't need gold flatware. You don't need metal flatware. There's many things you don't need. There are many things you do need. God will provide your needs. We must be discerning, distinguishing wants and even idolatrous cravings from needs, lest we charge God with unfaithfulness. So let's filter out those things that are wants that we crave and those things that are needs that he always provides. God will provide What do you need right now? Are you concerned about a new sound in the car that you need to drive to work? God will provide 
all your needs. I can't tell you how. And maybe it's going to be some strange circular road of provision that you never would have come up with. Sometimes I want the provision of all my needs to be one straight path called it's not broken. (laughs) Sometimes God leads you on a circular path called it's totaled. (laughs) And yet God provides all your needs. Sometimes I want the providing of all my needs to be comfortable without any uncertainty, without giving up any things that I enjoy. And and God says, well, no, I'm I'm not looking to replace myself with idols in your life. (laughs) I'm not looking to provide idols. I'm looking to provide needs. So, yes, God might remove some things in order to provide himself in their place, but he will provide all our needs. Are you a young couple and it's hard to see how the bills line up with the income? God will provide all your needs. Are you looking at aging and retirement and you're wondering how you're going to provide in your declining years? God will provide all your needs. Perhaps he'll do it through the church. Perhaps he'll do it in ways you could never imagine. Are you a young person wondering about college and how do you prepare for the future? and How do you think about providing for a family? God will provide all your needs. Not all your wants, not all your cravings, but all your needs. And that in itself is enough to bring comfort and peace and gratefulness to the heart of every Christian. This verse alone means that anxiety is always a waste of time and always sinful and always a defiance of God. This verse alone means we could stop staying up at night wondering where it's going to come from and stop getting up at morning with an immediate anxious thought. This verse alone, let alone hundreds of others in the Bible, is a way of communicating our God will not allow his own generosity to be questioned by forgetting about your need. And the context of this, here's the delightful context. The context of this is a church that sacrificially gives. So here's a church that actually increases their sense of need out of giving, out of sacrifice. Boy, isn't that a a, a strange financial way of doing life? I have certain needs that I know about. Let me do this. I will increase those by giving. I will reduce my safety net. I will limit my cushion. I will plumage, p- pillage my safety net. No, I will take away those things. Why? Uh, well, I'm going to give to the Lord, and that increases my needs. And I know now, God will provide now these new needs that I have because I gave and I sacrificed. Look, God will always match our sacrifice by his own generosity. God will always match our sacrifice by his own generosity. You won't see that same money again, but you'll see his provision in some other way. Or maybe he'll provide more money for you to give. God always meets our sacrifice with his own provision, his own generosity, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And it is crucial to remember that the Christ Jesus we are in, who is the basis for God's generosity instead of his wrath towards us, is the Christ Jesus who is rich and became poor to make many rich. The Christ Jesus who humbled himself in order to lift us up. The Christ Jesus who sacrificed himself in order to save us. This is the Christ Jesus we are in. And in that Christ Jesus, we have this promise that all of our needs will be met. Brothers and sisters, are you wondering how your next bill will be paid, but you are seeking to serve the Lord with the finances you have in giving generously and providing for others? The Lord will provide your needs. Are you sacrificing for the Lord, but you're wondering how the Lord's going to feed this many mouths on a monthly basis? The Lord will provide your needs. If you've been getting odd looks at work and you're wondering if bad news is coming, the Lord will provide your needs. Don't start looking to your safety net or your own resources before you look to the Lord who calls you to give and who promises to provide. The Lord will provide your needs. No wonder this leads Paul to his final culminating 
point. No wonder, no wonder he feels the need to go worshipful when this passage ends. Verse 20, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You can feel Paul's sense of awe and wonder. Paul says, consider this, consider this cycle. Paul was converted by God's generous grace from a life of murderous rage to sacrificial servanthood. And in that servanthood, Paul encountered the Philippians who heard about Jesus, and those very converts are now sending him sacrificial support for his mission. Their lives have been transformed by God's grace. They are living with a risky, sacrificial faith in support of the mission, and Paul is confident that God will provide for them abundantly will meet their needs in yet another display of his generosity, and surely God should receive the glory for it all. Only God could change selfish, self-focused individuals into giving individuals. Only God could take a murderer and turn him into a missionary. Only God could do that, so only God can get the glory. To God, the Father, be the glory. This Father who is so generous to save and to provide, to compel people to give as a fragrant offering to himself, to give them the privilege of pleasing him, and and to then provide for them in their giving. Only God could receive the glory for that kind of generosity. As We give, we give opportunity for God to glorify himself through our giving and in response to our giving in his abundant provision. As we live, I love Alcorn's phrase, as we live in risky faith, risky faith, as we live in risky faith, we are anticipating God glorifying his own generosity. Christian, as you live in risky faith, You are anticipating God glorifying his own generosity. Do you want to get in on the greatest chorus in the universe? Get in on this cycle, celebrating the generosity of God and being used to display the generosity of God so that God can glorify himself. It is living in risky, sacrificial, generous faith towards God that God will glorify himself by showcasing his faithful and abundant provision in our lives. When I was 13, uh, my dad wanted to (laughs) do like a a big birthday bonanza because he he wanted to gather some of the godly men in the church and some of their sons and have this moment of talking to me about growing as a man and being godly and everything. So we wanted it to be fun. So we went out to this sort of camp place, and there was a ropes course. Have you ever seen one of these ropes courses? Okay, so this was was a ropes course that you harnessed yourself and you, you climb up these trees and you go through the netting and at the end of it was this zip line where you hook yourself onto the thing and you went down 300 feet into this lake. It's a great 13th birthday party. Be envious of my dad if you're a young person right now, okay? <laughs> great party. So we did it. We, we went up there, me and my friends, and, and, and I had one friend that he was very uncertain about this zip line idea. Because you're... you're you're holding on to the thing that's attached to you, but it's holding on to the zip line. So you're not actually holding the zip line, because obviously you don't zip very much when you hold a zip line. So you can't hold it, you gotta, you gotta, and there has to come this moment where you're, you're connected to the line, but then you have to kind of shove yourself off this pine tree and zip down into the lake. And it's that little moment <laughs> that right now there's comfortable pine around me. But in a moment, there will be nothing but air and the line. You know, sometimes I think as Christians, we sort of want to hold onto the ledge and sort of inch our way down the line and find a way. Can't you just bring the tree with me? I want to go down, but if you could just let me hold onto the tree while I go, and I'll just sort of drag it down. And, and, and the person's saying, you know, it's not going to work. I appreciate what you're trying to do but it's not going to work. You have to let go. We are called to let go of trust in our own resources, in those things that we're used to holding on to, 
in order to experience the exhilarating joy of God's provision. What are the things that are keeping you from enjoying the anticipation of God's provision? I'm not saying everybody go quit your job, okay? I'm not saying empty your bank account tomorrow. I'm not saying, you know, some radical, insane, we shouldn't have forks or something. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm saying what are the things in your heart that the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart right now that you hold on to as a substitute for trusting the provision of the Lord? What are those treasures? What are those, you know, just comforting, just that tree trunk, it just, you know, I love the faith side, and I, I want to let go and, and enjoy God and trust God, but then there's just this thing over here, man, I am just holding on, and, and, and letting go doesn't mean you immediately part with all of those things. It might mean that, but it does mean at least spiritually you, you've got to let go. What are those things when you face some material difficulty that your mind immediately goes to? Well, yeah, but I have that. Yeah, but it, it's good because um, the income is good, and well, we could always do this. A strategy is all well and good, but strategy is not God. The mind should go to God will provide. What are those things you say, well, I could never give up that? Because that would be way too much. We, we couldn't live without that. Well, I think you could. What, what could we do to experience Paul's exhilaration? Don't you get the sense Paul's exhilarated most of the time? He's incarcerated in Rome. He has nothing, but he's more exhilarated than most of us will ever be. And part of the reason is, my God will provide. Off the ledge. Here we go. My God will provide. What are those things that are holding on to your hands and keeping you from zipping into the confident trust in God's provision? If they really are keeping you from trusting God, I would encourage you, let them go. Let them go. The Lord will supply every need of yours and it will be to his glory. It will be to his glory to provide for us. It will be to his glory. John Piper says, our purpose is to live in such a way as to make the surpassing worth of God in Christ look like what it really is. I could paraphrase him. Our purpose in sacrificing is to trust in such a way as to make the surpassing generosity of God in Christ look like what it really is. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to close this message with repeating that phrase a few times and you as the church communicating your affirmation by saying amen. I believe that's Paul's goal as he writes that, that that amen would resound in the heart of the church. Will our God supply every need of yours? Will he do it according to his riches in glory? Has he brought us into Christ Jesus? To him be the glory in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we confidently trust in you. If there is anything, Lord, that we are trusting in or clinging to that is not you, Lord, would you take it out of our hands and out of our lives? Lord, if it is a painful loss, we trust you in the pain of it. Lord, if right now you've already taken it out and we're having to wait in a season of not knowing when that knock will come at the door, we trust you that it will. 
We trust you that you will provide. Lord, we look back at the landscape of our lives and we recount the number of times you have knocked at the door of our lives and provided at the right moment. And we know you will continue to do that until that knock is your return. So, Lord, we know you will provide, and we trust you that you will provide. And, Lord, for any person who is currently facing an unmet need, I pray you would provide abundantly and miraculously for them. I pray you make us a generous church. I pray you make us a giving church. I pray you make us a motivated church to see your glory revealed in sacrificial giving and in celebrating your generosity. Lord, receive the pleasant offering of our trust in you. Receive it, Lord. Receive the pleasant offering of our giving. And Lord, showcase your generosity for your glory. Showcase it, Lord. Reveal it. Display it. And let us sing of it for your glory and your glory alone. In Christ Jesus, we pray. And Lord, thank you for providing a building that we can meet in. Lord, this building is far far beyond what we could have asked or imagined in praying that you would meet this need. That's beyond our needs, Lord. It's beyond even our imagination, Lord. And you have provided abundantly, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you. Bring this to mind, Lord, the next time we as a church face an unknown. You will provide in just the right way. Thank you for your generosity. Make us hungry to see it more. In Jesus' name, amen.